Again, you've got the scientific name, followed by a comma, followed, followed by your x and y coordinates. In this, in this case, they're, 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 they're longitude and latitude, but you know, they, could, they could be another coordinate system. Um, uh, if they're like latitude and longitude, then they need to be in decimal uh, degrees. So you've already seen that this morning. It's exactly the same data. It is just formatted ever so slightly differently. And you can you know, save that from a spreadsheet, save that from Excel, or save it as a CSV file. So in our interface, in the samples, we're just going to browse to that file. So I'm going to go up and be different on your computer, but you're going to browse to where you've saved it. Where do, I, where do I put all the results? Um, so you need to set an output directory. 
Um, so let's, let's um, actually we can probably create one within. So we browse, we're, we're in here, so let's go back. I'm going to put it, um, I'm going to put it at, at this level. I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call it um, I'm going to call it results one, and then I'm going to select that as my um, output and click um, OK. So all that is written here is a path to the output directory that I want the results to go in. And it was a point that, that, that's come up, and I think Kate will mention in a bit more detail from some of her experience at some point. But you need to come up, what you're going to start doing is creating tons of files with a lot of this GIS work and with a lot of this distribution work. You need to come up with your own way of storing the files and naming the files and things like that. So I've just created a folder called results1 here. Um, call it what you like, but you, you want to be careful. You want to start having your own system for how you're going to call the files and what um, uh, where you're going to save them. Okay, there's no right or wrong way of doing that, you need your own system that works for you so that you can trace back through and um, uh, understand you know, what, what results were what. Um, then all we're going to do for now is go into the, to the settings. There are not too many things that you need to worry about right now. I'm going to just flag a couple of things. Firstly, there's a, a, what's called a regularization multiplier. Um, which is, is, is one of the parameterizations in that center that affects, in effect, how tightly you fit to your calibration data. So when we've had all this discussion about overfitting, there's a default value in here of one that is often a very sensible number, but you'll want to change that number. And I'll just encourage you now for an experiment with run some, run some models where you change that number and then see what happens to your outputs. And you're going to find, you're going to see exactly what we've been talking about with, with fitting more closely or having more broad distributions depending on how you parameterize the model. Okay? And if you're writing a separate thesis or for a publication or for a report or something, anyone who knows something about some of these models are going to be saying, well, how did you parameterize the model? If you know about Max, what regularization value did you choose? More importantly, how did you choose it? Okay? And that's, that's probably, I would say, the most key um, thing to, to vary. So I'd encourage you when you have a play with this in the practical time to um, vary that number. To give you a, a rough scale, you know, values from 0.1 to 10 uh, are all probably, you know, there's no rule to this, but try those kind of values. I would say first try 0.5, then try 1, then try 3. So, you know, those kinds of numbers. Don't put 1,000 in there to start with. Okay? So that's a number to change. Um, uh, remember I said that you're going to be taking a, a random sample of, of background points and the default is 10,000, well we're just going to leave that as it is, there's, there's, there's rarely a reason to, um, to change that. There are other things that you can do here, for example, you can pull out a random test percentage. Okay? That's something that, I don't think you actually did this morning with the BioClean models, but it's something that you... Did, did you do that with the BioClean? I can't remember. I know some of us, yeah, you, you, you took out maybe 25% or 20%. So that's exactly the same here. This, but instead of saying what percentage should I use to build the model, this is saying what percentage should I use to test the model. So in, in terms of your, say, 80-20 split, where you use a bigger chunk to calibrate or to train the model, this time you're going to put in the smaller number there, okay? Because this is the amount that you're pulling out to test the model. So we could put in a number like, um, uh, 20 percent or so there. All right. Um, and there are other cross-validation approaches and things, <coughs> excuse me, that can be used, but we're, we're not going to do that um, right now. Another thing to mention is that you can put a path in here to a projection uh, folder. So let's just do that as the last thing. Uh, Enrique and Town um, put together some example data, so if we go back into our geo data, into Africa, we selected the present day climate um, to build this model, but let's project onto the 2050s climate, okay? So we're just going to select that folder, and what we're doing, what this is doing is saying that you're going to construct a model based on the data that you used to, um, in 
this main part of the interface. These are the variables that you're going to use to build the model. But then when it's built the model, it's just going to use the data within this projection layer to actually say, well, well what are the values on that layer? Okay, we're going to talk about that in, a, in, in more detail. Um, I just want to flag for now that that's, that's where you do it. In particular, <coughs> excuse me, if you, in particular, if you're interested in climate change applications, then uh, that is uh, where you will put in your future climate layers. Or if you're interested in a, an invasive species type application, then this would be where you would put in your other region that you want to project to. Okay? There's a ton of other things that, that you can play with in here, but that, that's, the, that's the basics. So what we're going to do now is hit run and hope that it starts doing its business. Um, this is the actual process of, of, of if you like, training the model. The measure it uses is, is, is gain, um, and it's going to meet certain criteria before it stops and says, all right, I've you know, kind of optimized the process. So there it goes, training. Hopefully it'll only take a minute or so. And then what we're going to get from this is a bunch of output files. It's going to write some, some, some output files. And we're in particular going to look at an HTML file that summarizes the outputs. I'm going to pull it up in like two minutes now to just show you that the model is run and where we want you to get to today if possible. Uh, and then I think we've got some time tomorrow for me to just spend another 10 minutes going through um, exactly what's, what's in that results file. It won't take much longer. Any questions? We're just while we're waiting for that to run. You can kind of feel like you're working when it's actually going away like this. You don't have a cup of coffee and kind of think, well, I'm kind of working. It's doing it for me, but yeah. <coughs> I was wondering, in the samples you put the, it appears the name of the species. For example, if I don't have the name of the species, and instead I put like station one, station two, but it has got the latitude and the longitude, will the model run the same? Yeah, excuse me, it, it will. It, actually, whatever, you could use any number of things there. The convention, you know, we expect to use it species, but they could be populations, they could be any number of things. The way the software works is it's just going to, in that you have those three columns in the CSV file, your latitude and longitude, the first column is just an identifier. We usually think of it as the species name, but it will group according to the identifier there. So they must all, they must be, you know, it must group. If you had station one, then you would need to have you know, a bunch of station ones. So you had all the occurrences because it will build the models for station one. That's your equivalent of a, of a kind of species. So the, the answer is yes, it will, it will do that. You just need to have you know, station one and then your latitude and longitude. We'll have to talk about that particular case a bit more because when you say station one, you mean that's a particular locality. Yeah, so that's probably a, not the right way of thinking about your data because so you would think you'd have station one, station two, station three. No, that, that information is identified by the latitude and longitude. And the, the, the first column is telling you like the groupings by species, by subspecies, by population, by genus, by any number of things that you might refer to. But that's telling you the, 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 the groupings that you're then going to build the model for. So you build your model for all of the you know, population one, or genus one, or lines um, in that first column. So um, it doesn't have to be species, but it has to be an identifier that, that says these are the group of occurrence records that I use to build my model. So let's have a look at that particular example when we think of stations during the practical time. One, one more quick question because we're already overrunning for, for this now, but yeah. When we come in terms of what happens for you to miss that to miss a data file? To miss a to miss a data file or are you referring? So we'll have a look at specific there are a number of error messages that come up. You might have missing files, 
You might have missing information from one of your locality points. There are a number of so in the practical plan we can we can have a look at specific examples. But to, I'm walking around too much. I'm going really unpopular. Um, even more unpopular. You already are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, to 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 function, the models need to have um, a, a suite of environmental variables. Bio one, bio ten, you know, etc. Whatever the variables are, and uh, a locality associated with those variables. So you might have so a common mis two common mistakes would be you have a um, an occurrence record, but it falls in a cell where you don't have any environmental data. So, for example, in regression showed a, a case where um, some of the occurrence records fell just into the ocean, right? And you weren't modeling whales or turtles or something like that. So they shouldn't be in the ocean. So in that case, there was no environmental data to build the model. So you're going to get that kind of error message then. Another mistake that's commonly made is when you're doing these kinds of predict projections, the environmental variables that you use have to be, and this isn't a quirk of this software, it's a, 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 a straightforward principle, they have to be exactly the same variables that you used to build the model when you're projecting. Okay, so if you included um, temperature and precipitation as your predictive variables when you calibrated the model, if you're going to predict to a different time scale or project to a different region, then you need to have temperature and precipitation as your two variables. And in Maxent, and I think it's most commonly, they need to be called the same because it's just saying, well, this is by the one, it doesn't, you know, it, it needs to, it needs to know what the name is, and then it's just interpreting different values. But you have to have exactly the same variables. So you couldn't have 10 variables to calibrate the model, but then you've only got nine of them in the other region or in the uh, other time slice that you're projecting to, so you leave one out. Well, it, it, it will give you an error message and say, I can't do it because I don't have enough information. Okay. So let me, let me just finish. So it, it's, it's finished running. Um, remember where we um, put our created a folder called results1? So let's go back to that folder and, and see what it's um, see what it's done. Okay, so it's created a, a whole bunch of files that we're not going to go through um, in detail now. For each of the species, there's exactly the same information because it's just run the same thing twice. Okay, so that's a start. That's why you, that halves the number of files here that, that you need to worry about. The key ones are really this ASC file. That's your prediction, just like you got out of um, Bioclip using Open Model this morning. That's your ASCII file. So you're going to be able to just load that in exactly the same way into QGIS, ArcMap, whichever approach you want to use. But we're using QGIS today. Um, it will the, the predictions will range from zero to one. Bear that in mind when you import the data. So that's your raw file that you want to have a look at, but there is also a HTML file here. Let's do a search by type. And one of the species is the, the uh, elephants. Um, and as I say, I'm going to talk through, there's a bunch of information up here. I'm going to talk you through it in a little bit more detail tomorrow, but for now I want to flag just one thing. So this is a, a, a rock curve that we'll talk about tomorrow morning. This is a table of results that talk about thresholds and emission rates and valuation statistics that we're going to talk about tomorrow morning as well. But here is just a picture of that ASCII grid file that I just showed you. So if you load that into uh, QJS, you should see something that looks like that. Of course, you can change the color scale and, and, and present it differently, but that is your prediction. And it should look um, at least vaguely similar to uh, the Python model in terms of, you know, it's, it's the same data that, that we've used there. And I, I, think, I think that it does, although we haven't, I haven't had any time to really have a close look at this. The very last thing that I would say is, of course, this is, this is now your logistic probability surface, going from very high probabilities in red down to very low probabilities in blue. Um, you have two types of data here. You have the white data, which are your training points, so 80% in the way that we did it. Uh, I think we did 20% in the way as the, as the test data. 
uh, 80% of your points are going to be little white squares, and then your test points, which weren't, that weren't used to build the model, are, are shown in purple here. Of course, you can present that differently in, the, in, in QGIS, and I would say, you know, for, for the final results, you want to load it in QGIS or, or another GIS to, to really present the results properly, but this immediately lets you see, um, see the prediction. So that's where we wanted to get to now. It's also going to make the predictions under the future scenarios again. I'll talk about that um, if, if we have time later in the week. But um, it's all very clearly set out. It's very clearly stated what each of the things are um, here. And if we go back to... Somewhere here, yeah. There's your key website. If you just Google Maxen and Stephen Phillips, you will get the first tip because it's very popular. Is this um, uh, website um, based in Princeton through um, Professor Robert Shapiro's um, uh, group, um, which has tutorials, it has the software, it has the papers all available for you to, to read through. So that was in a little bit longer than we were supposed to have, but um, it gets you started with loading in your data and, and getting out your, 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 your first result. And you should see that hopefully by the end of today, you'll all be able to put on your screen your Biofin model and your Maxent model, and hopefully as well your GARP model for at least this canned data set for, for, for the lions and, 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 and elephants.